Father, the Apostle Paul wrote to Colossians that the Father has qualified you to share in the inheritance in the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his dear Son. Oh, Father, we thank you that you have given to such what us a wonderful gift in your salvation through Christ. Be with Bruce Henderson as he intercedes for the church, Steve Levitt, as he leads in worship and brings us the word of God's grace. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with me for our call to worship, which is from Psalm 93, verse 1. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Our opening hymn is number 236, To God Be the Glory. because you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to offer his life for our sake on the cross. He is our strength and our song, and he has become our salvation. 
Thus, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone of our salvation and the Savior of the world. For no one in the world will ever find salvation in any other, nor can anyone come to you, Father, except through him. We acknowledge, gracious Father, that our salvation is all your work. We are utterly helpless to save ourselves or contribute any merit of our own in gaining your favor. But you took the initiative. You made the overture. You reconciled us to yourself through Christ. You made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You, the offended party, acted first on our behalf while we were still sinners, while we were willfully rebellious. <clears throat> You sent your son to redeem us from that bondage. He purchased us from the slave house of sin by offering himself as a substitute. <coughs> he took our place and carried our guilt to the cross. He bore for our sakes the just punishment of sin. Now we are slaves of righteousness. And it is our delight to embrace Christ wholeheartedly as our rightful master. He is not only our Lord to rule over us, he is also our Messiah and deliverer, our rabbi and teacher, our shepherd and caretaker, our great high priest and intercessor, the spotless Lamb of God who made everlasting atonement once for all. He thus put away our sins forever by the sacrifice of his son. So we embrace him alone as savior, trusting his work as fully sufficient. We forgo any attempt to gain our own righteousness, to supplement the work of Christ, to earn fresh merit in our eyes, or to fit ourselves for heaven through our own efforts. We come today by faith to the one who has already done everything for us. And even in that, we know that the only hope we have of abiding in Christ lies in the grace that made us alive to him in the first place. And so we cling with penitent faith, asking that you always keep us near the cross. May our worship this day bring you honor and glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Please stand with me as we say together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. Which is the fifth commandment? The fifth commandment is honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So I'm honoring my father this morning on Father's Day. Um, 
I have a little baggie at home, a little, little baggie, court size baggie of possessions that my father wanted me to have. Um, one of them is something I never wear, <laughs> which is a tie class from a church my dad pastored in the late 1970s. So, you know, Dartmouth Baptist Church, South Dartmouth, Mills. A little flag, he loved the old man on the mountain. Uh, so I got a stamp and a lapel pin, the old man on the mountain from uh, 1988. It's pretty cool. And then my dad gave me a three-piece chicken dinner. <laughs> it's in a box made out of wood. Three-piece chicken dinner is what it said. <coughs> I don't remember this. So you open the cover, and the street kernels of corn. <laughs> you get it now? So my dad was a funny guy. Yeah. <laughs> he found humor and stuff like this. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about my dad in a bit. You know, I've been in, in at three, the last three funerals I went to um, all had an honor, honor guard. Honor guard. Um, my father in law's funeral, uh, a funeral for my uncle last June, probably a year ago today. Um, and then uh, a funeral of a friend not long before that. And that word honor and an honor god, honor guard, that's a heavy moment. It's a heavy moment when you see the, the military representatives you know, go through their paces methodically, carefully, honoring the deceased, honoring our flag, presenting it to the spouse that survives. I want to talk about that word honor this morning. Because literally, it's heavy. It's what it literally means, heavy. I bring to my aid Mounts' complete expository dictionary of the Bible. If you need a good dictionary, I highly recommend it. Um, because it's really helpful in understanding both the Old Testament and New Testament use and meaning of what we have translated for us in our Bibles. So obviously the word I want to talk about is honor. The Hebrew word, I'm, and Pastor Steve, sorry, I don't know Hebrew. I'll just pronounce it like I read it, kabid. It literally means to honor. It has the basic meaning of weight. It can also mean by extension, be heavy or unresponsive. In a very literal sense, the term can refer to something or someone that is heavy. Eli was an old and KB heavy person, we read in First Samuel. And wealth uh, is measured, was measured in possessions. And because the wealthy had many possessions, they were heavy, right? Um, heavy with their belongings. In a metaphorical sense, heaviness can express sluggishness or unresponsiveness. So Pharaoh, his heart was heavy. It was unresponsive, same word that we use for honor. In the fifth commandment, it was heavy, unresponsive. In Isaiah 6, verse 10, heavy, heavy, heavy ears cannot hear God's commandments. Unresponsive. God's judgment or something as burden, burdensome as oppression from rulers or famine or things that go on in the world around us can be heavy. The grievous nature of sin is expressed using the same term, KB. The psalmist writes, my guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. 
Now we're going to turn to the use the, um, the Ten Commandments. So just as the wealthy can be heavy with their possessions, the prestige of their riches contribute weightiness or importance to their character, that is, to their honor. So to honor means to esteem highly or consider someone or something as worthy of respect, reverence, and awe. It's a heavy thing. Right? It's not some surface respect or, you know, I like you, you know, regardless of what we think about that person, it's heavy, it's deep. There's an admiration of reverence and awe that we have when we honor somebody. So children are commanded to honor, literally to make heavy their parents. Prophets could receive honor from the people of God. We read about that in 1 Samuel 9. However, honor is improper if it exceeds that which is given God. Or honor is improper if it's directed to oneself. And then there's another word that comes out of this KB, it's kabod. <coughs> Same root, to honor and glorify, glorify. So in a sense, when we honor God, we are acknowledging the unequaled value of his character. We are glorifying God. Um, we have a unique God. We're going to learn about that as we look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 today. So as we think about this word honor over the next few weeks, think about the heaviness of it, the, the weight of it, the importance of this fact that we are to honor all. And we'll get into those details in the weeks ahead. How do we do honoring so far? I'm actually going to come back to this topic. We're not having the Lord's Supper today, but in that spot in the service, I want to come back um, and encourage you a little bit more with this thought of what it means to honor. Um, but knowing that, you know, it's, it's easy to just neglect our responsibility to honor father and mother in those, in those words, right? <coughs> the depth of what that means. Um, let's uh, turn to the Lord with a time of a prayer of confession, um, a time of silent personal confession, and then we'll read together the confession of sin as it's printed in the Lord. Most holy and merciful Father, we acknowledge and confess before you our sinful nature, prone to evil and slow and good, and all our shortcomings and offenses. We alone know how often we have sinned, in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. We are ashamed and sorry for everything which we have done. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, 
we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our Father, we come this morning to praise and worship you, for it is written, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We thank you that we are able to freely worship. We thank you, Father God, for this day as we need it. For we live in a world that is groaning, waiting for redemption. We are living in a world where suffering is a universal experience. And so we groan, crying out for redemption. Therefore, we thank you for the showers that you have watered us with this past week, and for the deluge of blessings that you graciously pour out upon each of us every day. We thank you that you never stop pouring out your spirit on your children. Thank you that you never stop meeting us with sustaining grace, with intervening grace, with providing grace, with inseparable grace. By your grace, we never have a dry season. Because of your great love, we are not consumed, for your compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Heavenly Father, as we receive your grace and blessings through Jesus Christ our Lord, by the Holy Spirit, may we lift up our hearts in praise, adoration, <coughs> worship, thanksgiving, and supplication by the Spirit through your Son, to you, God, our Father. We pray for the family of Karina Jennings and the loss of their beloved daughter. Even as they grieve, may they experience your peace and comfort and be sustained knowing that she is at peace with you. Thank you for the 11 and a half wonderful years you gave this family to enjoy her presence. We also ask, Father, that you continue to heal her grandmother who suffered a heart, mild heart attack last week. So this family is grieving tremendously and dealing with much. And we ask that you would sustain them. We lift up Mary Tosher's daughter-in-law, Laney. May the treatments and medications prescribed for the diagnosed advanced breast cancer be effective. We pray that your will will be for her healing, good pain management, and shrinkage of the tumor. Heavenly Father, you know our needs before we do, and so we ask you to provide help for Sharon Kearney's friend, Tammy, wheelchair-bound and giving constant care to her son, Nick, who is verbal but needs tremendous help. We pray that there is a positive outcome with our recent meeting with a judge, yet we know that you provide in unexpected ways. We pray for the Phelps family and Liz's parents, especially her father, Jack, who suffered a stroke this past Monday. Though it was termed a minor stroke, we ask that his struggle with mobility will diminish daily. We also ask that you give the Phelps calmness over their interrupted move to Alaska, knowing there is purpose to all things. We lift up Sarah Gibbons, a former EPC member who had a very specialized heart ablation on Friday at the Mayo Clinic. We thank you, Father, for providing specialists with the necessary technical knowledge and skills to perform this delicate surgery and ask that Sarah is recovering comfortably at this time. Father, we ask for healing mercies on the Heisinger family who have been under the weather this week, for Fiona, Isaac, Mike. We pray that you will sustain Emma as she gives care to the Heisinger household and just protect this family and bring them all back to good health. We ask for travel mercies for Michelle DeFanti as she flies out tomorrow to California to visit her sister. And if it be your will, as they both come back on the 25th. May you keep Mackie Hooper and a team from her church safely in the palm of your hand as they are in the midst of a week-long missions trip to the Dominican Republic. We pray that you bless their work while there and safe travel on their return. We pray along with Satoshi and Kali Kawachi that our Lord will raise up more team members willing to minister to refugees and migrants full-time in Southern Europe. 
We lift up Ray David, Rochelle, and their three children, as well as Jose and Marley, as they continue to get settled in Southern Europe and move onto their language studies. May you give them each fluency and understanding in these new languages. We also ask for a timely renewal of the Kwachi's residency permit. We thank you, Father, for the gift of your servants, Steve and Candy McGee, and also Steve and Janet Wardance. Give them safe travels, restful time with their families, and a respite from the urgencies of day-to-day -day responsibilities. <coughs> Lord, we know not what of good or ill may be reserved for us. Of weary ways or golden days before your face we see. But we know whom we have believed and are persuaded that you are able to keep that which we've committed unto him against that day. Heavenly Father, all your word is pure, true, and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. <clears throat> Be with Stephen Levitt this morning as he brings us your message. And also to Ernie Shipman this evening as he preaches your word. Pour showers of blessing on them both as they bring us your word. And we ask this in the name of Jesus our Lord, Savior, Priest, and King. Amen. Amen. First scripture reading this morning will be from Psalm 26, which is on page 459. Bruce, we almost sang that song today. Almost. Almost. Thank you for appreciating that. <coughs> psalm 26, you hear the word of the Lord. It's a psalm of David. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind, for your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness. I do not sit with men of falsehood, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Do not sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men, in whose hands are evil devices, and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground. In the great assembly, I will bless the Lord. <coughs> the next reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 36 through 46. And here we have Jesus praying in, in the Garden of Gethsemane. So Matthew 26 starting in verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And talking with him, Peter, and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you cannot watch with me, watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father, 
if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And our sermon text this morning is Deuteronomy chapter 6, which is back on page 151. So please stand with me as I read the entire chapter. Now this is a commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over, to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life. That end that your days may be long. Hear that, hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you, with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant, and when you eat and are full, take care, then take care, lest you forget the Lord, who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God who you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from the face of the earth. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test, as you tested him at Massa. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he has commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may go well with you, and that you may go in and take possession of the good land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers by thrusting out all your enemies from before you, as the Lord has promised. When your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and grievous against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household before our, before our eyes. And he brought us out from there, that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all this commandment before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us. And the Lord bless the reading of his word. I think Doug made a comment, the whole chapter. Yeah. Well, Steve McGee preaches on the whole chapter on Sunday evening, in about 12 minutes. He's watching this morning. So I figured I could do a whole chapter. 
We, we, we double that time. Um, it's interesting. Time time is fascinating to me. I mean, Twenty five years ago, nineteen ninety nine. It seemed like oh, it's a generation, isn't it? A generation passed. Um, Twenty five years ago. Um, Sarah and I were in a Bible study with uh, Bill and Beth Speed before they came to um, Exeter Presbyterian Church. With, uh, Bill and Beth and then another couple, Tammy and Joey Bailey. Uh, Tammy was a church planter here in Exeter. And the six of us got together over a series of probably eight to ten weeks. And um, we did all the rage at the time, which was we studied Henry Blackaby's experiencing God. So if you, you might have heard of it. Uh, it's a pretty interesting book. I don't necessarily agree with it 100%, but it was a transformational study in our lives. Um, it was something that the Lord used that would ultimately lead Sarah and I out of a large mega church to go and work alongside this church planter and his wife in a small little church here in Mexico. Um, it was pretty amazing. One of the one of the there's seven things that Blackaby teaches in this book. Um, seven, seven summary statements, but the one that I think is pretty interesting. It's actually the fifth one. God's invitation for you to work with Him always leads you to a crisis of belief that requires faith in action. So God's invitation for you to work with him always leads to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. You know, we read Matthew 26, 36 to 46, where we have Jesus, fully human, fully divine. The two, nat two natures of our Savior, fully human and fully, di fully divine. And it could be said that Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, was having a crisis of belief. His human will in nature said, not this. Right? The divine will said this. Not this and this. In that crisis of belief, showed his faith and his action by submitting his human will to the divine will. And he did that for us. And it's an amazing thing. You know, Jesus was tempted, Matthew chapter 4, but he knew how to overcome temptation with the word of God. He, he was experiencing trial in the garden. <clears throat> His human nature said, this is not fun. I don't want this to happen. But the divine will, it's what he accepted. And really, that is our challenge as believers, as those who have been called God's children, who've come to faith in Christ. <laughs> it's that work that he accomplished there. But our challenge is to align our human will with the divine will. And I really think that's where this passage in Deuteronomy 6 takes us today. It takes us to a place where we are called to remember where we've come from, reflect on what God has done and what God is doing, and then to repeat it to tell the story again, to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's guarded, this teaching is guarded by this commandment that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our everything. It's what is the motivation for everything that we do. We have one God, and he's the one we're to love, and it should impact 
all that we are and in, in impacting in all of our lives. So this was written to a people at a time and a place, very specific, right? You know, people who were brought out of slavery, out of Egypt. Um, but I believe the teaching of God's word transcends time and is for the family, for us, for God's family. And it's lived out through earthly families. And it's lived out in our land, in our church, where we're at. So let's take a peek at these three aspects of um, Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're not going to, we'll cover all of them. And I'm not going to read the whole thing all over again, although it would be probably helpful. I'll read it tonight. Um, so the book of Deuteronomy is the fifth and final book of the Pentateuch, the book of the law. It contains Moses' last three sermons, which must have been very long, and two prophetic songs about the future. And it was written for the Israelites as they were about to enter the promised land after they were delivered from slavery in Egypt, a 40 year wandering in the wilderness. And Moses reminds them of God's promises, his covenant. In the whole book, he emphasizes worship, obedience. He, em he emphasizes the protective nature of God's laws. And actually the name Deuteronomy means second law, signifying that Moses gives the law a second time in the preceding <laughs> chapters, you know, the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy chapter five. So what I would like to challenge us to do is to set our hearts on what God wants us to hear from this passage. And I think the first thing he wants us to hear, in summary, is I want you humans to align your will with my will. So start by remembering, remembering, remembering. Remember the journey. <clears throat> Remember from what you have been delivered. <clears throat> Remember what I have told you in the past. Remember, you've been called to faithful living. And you're called to faithful judging. You're called to be faithful. So these are the instructions from the Lord. The first three verses are really an instruction for us to honor. It's heavy. To fear the Lord. To hold in high regard with reverence God in the place that he is the God of our fathers, the one that made promises. He's the one you are to hold in that seat. And, and these are commands and words and statutes and rules that are given to us to be kept They're for your benefit. And they're to be kept today. They're kept to be going forward, to, kept, to be kept going forward. And he tells us that there's blessing. You keep these, there will be, you know, good in the, in the land that I'm giving to you. We need to be careful to do so. You know, one of the things that we've talked about, I think, maybe, uh, is that God has given us his commands and we get to keep them. We don't have to. We get to. That's a huge difference, isn't it? If you are obliged to do something all the time, you would know. <coughs> no. If we get to do something, it's a privilege uh, to love the Lord your God with all your everything. Yeah. It's a privilege to honor your father and mother and to have no other gods before him and to speak the truth. Uh, it's a privilege to do what God has commanded. So it, these commandments, we don't keep legalistically, but with gratitude. We get to keep the commandments of the Lord. If we think of them like an obligation, we won't keep them. If we think of them as a privilege, God is telling us here, you should have some success in keeping all that I've commanded. And in this, um, in this passage, really verses four through eight, 
we have in verse 4 the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's a statement that speaks to the uniqueness and the unity of God. First and foremost, you shall have no other gods before me. There is no other. That's the first commandment. This is the one that we are to love, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. We're to love the one, the one God, with all of our everything. The commandment that the Lord, the commandment here is that the Lord be seated on the throne of our lives. That we would love God entirely. Why would we do that? We love because he first loved us. First John. And those are realities that we're to impress upon the lives of others, upon our hearts and upon your children's hearts. We remember to teach these words to the next generation. And then, you know, there's this little imagery. You shall teach them diligently to your children, shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And then there's a sign on your hand. You, you get this imagery that at all times this needs to be your heart and your mind with your strength this is what we're to do we're to remember and love our god we're to have things in our pathways of life on our journey that remind us of who god is and remind us of what he's done for us he might not have redeemed us from the house the, of slavery in Egypt. He did that for some people, but he certainly redeemed us from the house of slavery to sit. Right? He's done something remarkable for us. So we're to have things in our pathways of life that cause us to remember the one true God, that cause us to love him with all of our everything. You know, once a week we get to do this, right? We're doing it right now as we come together for worship, as we remember the Sabbath. When we have fellowship, we encourage each other. It's the beginning of a new week. Who knows what tomorrow's gonna hold? But are we better off for having been here today? Absolutely. It's a good thing for us to be together. So we're to remember. Remember the journey. And then we're to reflect. When things are going well, Reflect on the source of these good things. When things are difficult, reflect. Think about what it means when we experience trial. Reflect on the source. In verses 10 through about 18, 19, we kind of get this idea about reflecting. See, there's good that happens to us. These people go into the land and they acquire houses and cisterns and fields. They don't have to do any work to, you know, get the benefit of that land. Reflect on that. Reflect on the source of that good, the benefit of what I've promised to give to you. The Lord provided all of that. In the same way, he provides us all that we need. You know, he's given us salvation, yes. But beyond that, he gives us all that we need. He gives us all that we need to overcome temptation. He gives us all that we need, especially when we acknowledge that. You know, there's, there's an element here in verses 12 to 15 that says, reflect on the source of these good things. Don't take credit for yourselves. Right, because you can say, it's easy to say, well, you know, look what, look what we've done now. You know, and, and, and now I'm being prideful and not that I'm, I'm finding my sufficiency, who I am in the success of what God has done and now it's all about me, right? That's not what God wants us to do. He wants us to reflect on him as a source. For us, the Lord has brought us from a place of danger from the wrath of God to life. He's brought us from a place 
of danger to a place of safety. Look at what he's done for us. Reflect on that. And then you can ask yourself the question, who am I serving now? Who do I fear? You know, is it that one true God? Am I loving him with all of my with everything? We're cautioned to ask ourselves that question, what gods are we following? Are we following the gods of the world around us? Well, they will disappoint. Or are we following the one true God? You know, one of the famous uh, phrases that, or popular phrases we hear is, who's got your back? Like, who's got our back? Ultimately, God's got our back. You know, I can't trust on the person necessarily right behind me, but we can trust the God. You know, there's this idea, there's a reflect, the verb reflect, but there's also this idea of a reflection. Our reflection is beside us, it's in front of us. If I was outside at 4.30 this morning and I almost went outside, but I could have seen my reflection. And the sun was not there. It was so beautiful. Um, you know, we, it, it's, the, there we are figuratively, right? It's just a shadow of who we are outside when we are in the light. And, and so are the commandments of the Lord, right? The statutes of the Lord, they're always there. They're always there for us to listen to and to observe and take in. Um, they're there even when it's dark. Right? They're intended to be part of life. They're not something we want to test. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Who used those words? Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. You, know, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And so, even as a reflection, they are light to us, right? All around us and all the time. So in times of trial, we don't want to put the Lord our God to the test. We're to joyfully keep and maintain the commandments of the Lord. And actually consider it pure joy when you experience trials, knowing that what? That testing increases our faith. It doesn't cause us to go in another direction. The third aspect of this is to repeat. And it's really verses 20 to 25. And I might, I might put it this way. What's the reason for the hope you have? Why do you do what you do? Frank? Or John? Dick or Louis, why do you do what you do? What's the reason for what's the reason for the hope you have? My grandsons are showing up, oh, they're probably over in the playground now. Yeah, they came up from Park Street this morning. I want my grandsons to say, What's the reason for the hope you have? Right? I want my sons to ask that question. Yeah. But isn't that, that's the reality. We have this opportunity to bring the word of God. The Lorenda's get it, like six kids, right? We have the opportunity all day long to take and repeat the truths of God's word and promises to those children. So when your son's son asks you, you an answer, right? And Give a testimony to God's work and purposes in your life. Talk about the change that's happened in your life. I was dead in my trespasses and sin, but God made me alive. What does that change look like? Help others understand God's transformative work as you remember and reflect on his goodness. So I, I think that was not 20 minutes. That was pretty good. Um, the Lord has purpose for us in this chapter. He does. He has, our land might be different, but their blessings are no different. You know, that opportunity we have to live gratefully, obediently to the Lord is no different. And as we do so, that draws us near. It doesn't push us away. 
right? It keeps us walking on that narrow path that God has for us as we align our wills with his will. So in remembering, we're putting God first. We're recognizing his plan and purpose in all things. We're focusing our love on the source of love. In our reflecting, we are honoring and glorifying God. We are enjoying the good things he has planned now and forever. We're enduring through trials, being shaped into the people he purposes us to be. Because we know all things are working together for good. And in our repeating, we're reaffirming the truths of God in our, in our hearts and into the lives of others. We're light to the world around us. We're making disciples, teaching them all that has been commanded, teaching the ways of a Christ follower. In our repeating, we are loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, and our might. Why? We love him because he first loved us. And that really is our first act of obedience, to love him. Obedience to the divine will led Jesus to his arrest, trial, and crucifixion. His perfect obedience was required to be the only sacrifice that could atone for our sin. And he did. Praise God for that. There is good news in this because there's a resurrection. Oh, and he knew about that too. Three times he said it. There's his ascension. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is Savior and Lord. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And our obedience, our first act of obedience is to love God for that gift. To acknowledge the need for his love. To acknowledge our need for the sacrifice. In that way, it's not the keeping of the law, per se, that is our righteousness, but our faith will then be our righteousness. And we accordingly get to live out our lives of obedience to the divine will of God, submitting our human will to his. So love God. Remember. Reflect. And repeat. This Put on faith every day and walk in the way that the Lord desires. Where are you at on this journey? Where have you come from? How is God working in your life and heart, even here in this moment? How do those around you see and hear about God's work? Our testimony is centered on our redemption, the fact that we've been bought with a price. And it's evident as we live, as we serve the Lord, gratefully obedient to all that he purposes for us, that we might joyfully glorify as him, glorify God as we go. Let's pray together. Father, um, we're thankful for the work of your son. It's only because of that that we can be here this morning. Um, that we, we've come joyfully knowing that um, the sacrifice for our sin has been accomplished. He has paid the price to buy us out of the house of slavery to sin and into the house of slavery to righteousness. So guide us, help us to see your purposes in all that's going on in our lives today. Help us to understand more fully what it means to be obedient in a grateful kind of way, that you would be honored and glorified.
pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our hymn is hymn number. I realized we skipped a hymn. That's okay. Number 496, My Jesus, I Love You. Let's stand together. 496. is it that you believe? I believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, <coughs> suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. decided to ask us a question that made us actually think, um, which is really good. 
he asked us, what was your parents' relationship like when you were growing up? And it's honestly not something I thought about in probably, I don't know, 40 years. Um, and while Sarah and I had different experiences, apparently, <laughs> is that the sign I'm supposed to be doing? Yeah. <laughs> While Sarah and I had different experiences, there were many common themes. One primary common theme was that of faith, commitment to the Lord in his church. And so it was actually really good to think back 40 to 55 years. I mean, it was 40 years ago, pretty much when. We are not quite 40 years when we were married, it's 39 this year. But it's a long time ago. And that made me think about my parents' parents. So I'm a son's son. So now I started to think about my parents' parents. The things they held in common. Deep faith. Commitment to the church. They were wonderful grandparents. Um, though they were very different. Very different. I can't think of a, two couples more different. Unified in the faith. My sisters and I were totally blessed to be their grandchildren. They loved us in different ways. My grandfather, my mother's father, he would sit and do Deuteronomy 6 with me. My dad's father would model it. He wouldn't talk about it. He would just model it. Um, and it was pretty cool. They modeled a Christian life and leadership in their churches. One of those churches was Park Street Church in Boston, where my grandfather and great-grandfather were deacon and deacon emeritus. You know, it's pretty amazing. Big popular, you know, big city church. My other grandfather started a church with a group of friends on Cape Cod in their living room. And I'm thankful for those godly men and women that God has put out there. So one way to honor father and mother before them is to remember them and to recall on what you've learned from them, recall what they taught, think about what they model. It's not always good. We need to be honest about that, right? There are challenges in life that everything's not going to go rosy all of the time. But even then, we can remember that and learn from that. We can reflect on the providence of God in our lives, in our upbringing, to see where we are today and where you'll be in the future. Do you see how the impact they had on your life is being repeated today through you? Perhaps it takes years to figure that out, maybe not. Perhaps you're modeling things for children and grandchildren or great-grandchildren now. Or perhaps you're a child who will have that opportunity to learn from father or mother, grandparents, great-grandparents. Either way, as we do that, as we learn and listen, we're achieving what's been articulated for us in Deuteronomy chapter 6 if we're being encouraged to love the Lord, our God, with all of our everything. What a way to honor, honor God and to honor our parents to continue in that way. And so to that end, my dad, when he was 65 years old, um, wrote his memoirs. And um, so that was 2000 when he wrote his memoirs the first time. He updated them in 20, 2005, 2010, and 2015. <laughs> Um, he passed away in February 2016, and uh, I just, it's my tradition to read my dad's memoirs on Father's Day. I did it this morning. Um, I thought I'd be an emotional wreck, but it was actually really good today. Um, and so I've got about 35 copies of No Enduring City, the memoirs of Ray. Love it. My dad. Um, there's some on the table. Take one per family, or take one and share it with other people in the congregation. Um, my dad was a pretty simple man, he lived a pretty unassuming life, and had a great love for the Lord 
and it kind of comes out in the story. So uh, there's, there's a bunch of them there for you. Thank you. Um, it's one way to honor my dad, mm -hmm. uh, just to remember. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad, I'm grateful that he's done this because um, it kind of puts me back in time. Um, if I had a memory, I'd do it too. <laughs> Anyways, so please feel free to take one of, one of these books. Our closing hymn this morning is um, hymn number 538, Take My Life. Let's stand together as we <laughs> rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful let the word of christ dwell dwell in you richly admonish teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to god and whatever you do in word or deed do everything in the name of the lord jesus giving thanks to god the father amen, amen. amen.